I do not come to the subject of Bernard Lewis as a, uh, as a disinterested observer. Uh, I first met him in 1976 when I was a graduate student at Princeton, and he was a recently arrived uh, transplant from London. Uh, by progression, he became my teacher, my PhD advisor, professional mentor, and then a personal friend. There were 38 years between us, but the age difference never seemed to matter much. Instead, he seemed to defy aging. This he attributed to good genes, a daily walk, and a scotch each evening before dinner. Um, in 1996, I organized a conference in Israel in honor of his 80th birthday, uh, thinking it would pretty much cap the final act of his career. Uh, who would have imagined that five years later that he'd have two New York Times bestsellers and have become a true celebrity. But he didn't continue to speak and write simply because he could. Uh, true, no one had his combination of profound knowledge and clear exposition. But that's not why he refused to surrender to old age. He came up for another round and then another because a fire burned within him. That fire never burned more intensely than at times of war, in particular when freedom and democracy came under attack. I'd like to devote the few minutes I have to Lewis in World War II, the Cold War, and what I'll call, after one of his book titles, The Crisis of Islam, three wars that constituted for him a continuum. In 2006, Lewis, who was then 90, told an interviewer this. The most vividly remembered year of my life was the year 1940. I submit that 1940 is essential to understanding what drove Bernard Lewis. The year of Dunkirk and the fall of France, the Battle of Britain and the Blitz. The year of blood, toil, tears and sweat, their finest hour. Lewis was 23 years old, already regarded as a prodigy, indeed a genius. One of the last things he did before his mobilization was to rush his doctoral dissertation into print. It was published in London in 1940. Lewis didn't regard it as a finished product, but he published it anyway because he wasn't sure what fate the war held in store for him. Lewis was always reticent when it came to the details of his five years of service. He spent some time at Bletchley Park helping to break codes. 1941, he moved over to MI6. He described his task there as translating texts mostly from Arabic. For much of the time, it was just a desk job. Uh, later, some admirers and also detractors fancifully cast him as Lewis of Arabia. Uh, far from it. Only in the summer of 1945, when the war was almost over, did his duties take him to the Middle East. Otherwise, he said, I spent the greater part of the Blitz years living, working, and more remarkably, sleeping in London. Now, as it happened, uh, this was a far more dangerous place than anywhere in the Middle East. Um, 43,000 civilians perished in the Blitz. In terms of deaths, that comes to almost two 9-11s a month for eight months of almost ceaseless bombing. And yet, civilian morale held, and Lewis was a case in point. In his memoirs, uh, he recalled that at first, he took shelter in tube stations. But I soon got tired of this, he wrote, and decided to stay in my bed and take my chances. One can get used to anything. Uh, many years later, in 1991, he found himself in Tel Aviv when some Iraqi scuds fell on the city. Uh, the Israelis, some of whom were seized by panic, disappointed him. A few dozen raining scuds, he said, were like a quiet night in London, 1940. In 1940, Lewis later said, we knew who we were, we knew who the enemy was, we knew the dangers and the issues. In our island, we knew we would prevail, that the Americans would be drawn into the fight." End of quote. But the war shattered the complacency of a generation. Freedom and democracy were fragile constructs. They had determined enemies, and in a moment's hesitation, they might be extinguished. 
In September 1945, at war's end, Lewis wrote a poem entitled The Dirge. It dwells not on victory, but on its terrible cost. I quote from the opening. In the bleakness of German plains, in the stillness of English woods, in the squalor of Polish towns, in the clamor of London streets, I see them die. I don't think Lewis often shared his emotions about these years, but make no mistake, the war that reduced much of civilized Europe to ruins, but left Britain shabby and impoverished and exterminated Europe's Jews, became Lewis's prism on the world. He later called the, world, the war the seminal experience of my life. Of his own generation, he wrote that, and I quote him, their every thought, their whole lives were dominated and indeed shaped by the titanic struggles in which they had participated or witnessed. And that was Lewis too. He would be ever vigilant in the defense of liberal democracy, lest it ever be threatened with extinction again. Nor could he forget that in freedom's most imperiled and finest hour, many Arabs had sided with the enemy. After all, he'd spent the war translating evidence of their collaboration. The World War was followed by the Cold War. Uh, for Lewis's generation, this gave rise to some ambivalence. He once described his own early approach to history as quasi-Marxist. In 1953, he said this, and I quote him, I grew up in a generation which was deeply affected by what was happening in Russia, and which felt, generally speaking, that with all the brutalities and crimes of the Russian Revolution, it nevertheless represented something valuable and significant for humanity. Bliss was it in that dawn to be alive. And I am therefore perhaps able to understand something of the attraction as well as of the repulsion of the communist creed. Uh, the attraction, he added, was that it had perverted to its service some of the noblest aspirations of the human race, peace, social justice, the brotherhood of man, and has used them with deadly effect. Uh, very early in the Cold War, Lewis identified the Soviet Union as the prime threat to the world his generation had fought to save. Indeed, for Lewis, the World War and the Cold War melded into one. Like the Nazis, Lewis wrote, the communists are anti-Western in the double sense. They are against the Western powers, and they are also against the Western way of life. In the 1950s, he later said of the early Cold War, the choices before us still retain something of the clarity even the starkness which they had through the war years. In this struggle, there was no guarantee of victory. Uh, I am by no means certain, he wrote in the 1950s, that democracy represents the common destiny of mankind. In particular, he saw the Arabs preferring the Soviet Union for the same reason, as he put it, that their predecessors had preferred the Third Reich. In the Middle East, only democratic Turkey and democratic Israel were reliable. The Turks, because they had long experience of Russian imperialism, and the Jews, because of their long experience of Russian anti-Semitism. Turkey and Israel were the forward positions against the enemies of freedom deserving full support. Now in America, there were many who saw things as Lewis saw them, and I, I imagine that at any time, Lewis could have crossed the Atlantic permanently. But he settled late in this country, in 1974, at the age of 58, and almost missed his moment. When he arrived for good, the Scoop Jackson Democrats embraced him. But by then, the United States had already begun to roll back the Soviet Union in the Middle East. Lewis, in America, would be much more influential in defining what he once called the return of Islam as the next threat to freedom and democracy. That was the title of this famously prescient article published in Commentary in 1976. The Iranian Revolution in 1978 made the threat apparent in ways even he hadn't anticipated. And by the time the Twin Towers came down on 9-11, no one had done as much to flag the danger as Bernard Lewis. In his first war, World War II, Lewis had been a bit player. In his second, the Cold War, a supporting actor. But in this one, he would play the lead. 
But there's a vast misunderstanding of how Lewis conceived this war. It can be attributed to Sam Huntington. Uh, when Huntington came up with his clash of civilizations, he credited Lewis with first use of the phrase. Now, technically, this was correct. Lewis coined it as early as the 1950s to describe the history of conflict between Islam and Christendom. But Lewis was uncomfortable with the way Huntington generalized his turn of phrase. On one occasion, he described Huntington's thesis to me as too harsh. And in one of his revised books, he replaced clash of civilizations with encounter. So it's unfortunate that so many obituaries focused on Lewis as the source of Huntington's concept, because he wasn't. Lewis did believe in a perpetual clash, not between civilizations, but between freedom and tyranny. The threat to freedom could emerge from any civilization, including, obviously, Europe's. And democracy could take root in any civilization, despite its origins in Europe. Anyone, he asserted, and I'm quoting, anywhere in the world could develop democratic institutions of a kind. Lewis believed that Islamism and extremes of Arabism were implacable foes of democracy and freedom. But he thought that Islam, the faith, wasn't antithetical to either. With Western, especially American, encouragement and assistance, Arab societies could evolve their own forms of democracy. Alas, if the Cold War lacked some of the starkness of World War II, this new and unnamed war, this crisis of Islam, seemed even more baffling than the Cold War. As Lewis himself acknowledged, and I quote him, it is different today. We don't know the issues, and we still do not understand the nature of the enemy. So was it Islam? Was it Islamism? Was it terrorism? Global jihad? We are weak and undecided and irresolute, Lewis complained, but I think the effort must be made. Either we bring them freedom or they destroy us. This is the voice of 1940 speaking. And at a simple reading, it seems like a jarring exaggeration. The Nazis could have destroyed, might have destroyed us if we hadn't defeated them and freed Germany. The Soviets could have finished us off in a morning. But who could today? Could any terrorist group, any Arab regime, or even Iran, come close to posing such a threat? No. But this statement shouldn't be read as a specific warning. It was Lewis's way of insisting that we must never take freedom and democracy for granted, as though they were the established way of humankind. In the World War and the Cold War, tyranny never surrendered. It only retreated when defeated. And unless it is defeated, where it still reigns, it might gradually, at first, imperceptibly, roll back that which, we, that which we've gained at great cost and ultimately confront us <laughs> with the stark choices of 1940 again. Lewis, in the last chapter of his life, longed to see one more decisive victory within that civilization to which he devoted his scholarly life. He thought he glimpsed its beginnings in Iraq. Iraq, he said in 2008, when everyone had gone sour on it, and I quote him, is being ruled by a democracy, by a free elected government, that faces free opposition. It proves what is often disputed, that the development of democratic institutions in a Muslim Arab country is possible. What, I, what is happening in Iraq, I find profoundly encouraging." End of quote. Call it folly, call it hubris, call it the triumph of hope over experience, but also admit that it rests firmly upon the most fundamental belief that we all share, that all of humankind is created equal, and deserves to govern itself by what Lewis once called the best and most just form of government yet devised by man. It's too early to say how Bernard Lewis will be remembered, but if the Middle East ever finds its way to democracy, he'll deserve to be recalled as the prophet of its freedom. Thank you.